The next talk this morning is by Ehud Altman from Weizmann Institute. And he will, uh, the title of his talk is Universal Dynamics and Entanglement Patterns Near the Many Body Localization Transition. Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kedar and Subroto for inviting me here. Always nice to be back uh, to India again. Um, I feel a bit sleepy. I don't know why. It's just a three and a half hour, uh, hour difference. Uh, maybe it's the extra half hour. Um, but <laughs> so you'll have to help me with asking lots of questions. Um, OK, I'll talk about um, many body localization and specifically the many body localization transition with emphasis on, on universal physics near the transition. And I'll show that entanglement has, is, is a good variable to look at, at least theoretically, to characterize uh, the transition. Uh, the work I'll mainly be talking about was, actually all the work I'll be talking about was done in some collaboration with my student, uh, Ronen Vosk. And the main work I'll uh, discuss is also together with uh, David Hughes. Um, it's now in the archive. I should have put some uh, archive marker, but you can find it. And, and it's related to a lot of uh, other work done with um, uh, all these people um, that I'll mention. Um, and also, I forgot a, at the end of the talk, if I'll have time, if not, maybe we can discuss privately. I want to talk about some uh, new experimental results on many body localization that we're uh, collaborating on with uh, the group of Emmanuel Bloch. So, OK, so let me, as an introduction, remind you that the conventional wisdom in condensed matter physics, or at least hard condensed matter physics, is that uh, quantum mechanics is manifest only in ground state. So basically, we always try to cool our systems to the ground state as much as possible. Uh, and there, we expect to see uh, various many body quantum effects, like the quantum Hall effect. Uh, topological insulators, Fermi liquid is just a zero temperature. It's sharply defined only at zero temperature uh, as, a, as a quantum ground state. And also quantum critical points are only sharply defined uh, at zero temperature, although they have their signatures uh, at elevated temperatures. But, but the common wisdom is that if you take a system and observe its dynamics for long times, if it's out of its ground state, uh, if it's at finite temperature or at some finite energy density, then quantum effects will completely wash out at um, long times. Um, and in fact, uh, so, so I, I, most of this talk will basically want, I, I want to, to um, show that there is a, an alternative to this. And you can have a true many body quantum behavior also away from the ground state. But, but let me first show why, why is this expectation true in many cases. Uh, so there, there are two generic paradigms I'll talk about. One, one is thermalization. And, and that's the conventional paradigms we're used to. If we take a cup of coffee and put milk on top of it, it mixes eventually. And because of ergodicity, it becomes, uh, uh, the milk becomes thermalized with the rest of its environment. And in, in a sense, if we had, if we also take a quantum system like that and, and start it with some quantum information and some local degrees of freedom, uh, these degrees of freedom rapidly get entangled with the rest of the system as the system thermalizes. That's the meaning of thermalization in a, in a many body quantum system. And as this degree of freedom gets entangled with the environment, it loses all its quantum coherence. So quantum correlations are lost, and the only information left in the system are uh, classic, is classical information associated with some slow variables like order parameter fields or uh, conserved quantities that take a long time to transport from one point to another. And, and this kind of dynamics is ve very well described by the standard classical hydrodynamic description that's amazingly successful in describing the long time dynamics of many systems, even if they're microscopically quantum mechanical. OK, um, but many body localization, it's the other paradigm I have here in the left, is, is an example where this can uh, fail. This thermalization can fail. And um, 
in particular, so this is an example with a collection of spins that are localized and the meaning of this localization is also, and I'll talk about it in more detail, is also that quantum, local quantum information, instead of getting entangled with the rest of the system completely, some of it at least uh, is left in these local degrees of freedom and persists indefinitely uh, in the dynamics, even if the dynamics is at high energies. Um, and, and because of that, because quantum information persists, even in local accessible degrees of freedom, you need a, a fully quantum description to, the, to describe the long time dynamics, okay? So one needs an alternative description. Um, and from this, it's clear that the transition between these two um, states of dynamics is, is very interesting because it's, first of all, we'll call it the many body localization transition. And essentially, it represents an interface between a macroscopic world described by classical physics eventually at long distances and long times, and another you know, type of microscop ma macroscopic world that nonetheless needs a quantum description. So it's this interface between qu quantum and classical description that's uh, um, inherent to, to this many body localization transition, uh, which makes it, I think, very interesting fundamentally. And there is another perspective of all this. So we know if we have a quantum system, we can look at its dynamics, but we have um, a dual perspective in terms of eigenstates and in thermal, uh, thermalization, and I'll talk about it in slightly more detail in, in a few minutes. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, there is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. If a system is thermalizing, the hypothesis says, then even if I look at a single eigenstate, this is essentially the, micro, the extreme limit of a microcanonical ensemble. I look at the single eigenstate, all correlations in that eigenstate are thermal, and in particular, the entanglement entropy of these eigenstates, I don't mean the ground state, but actually high energy eigenstates with some extensive energy, uh, if, if I measure the entanglement entropy of some subsystem inside uh, this uh, larger uh, a system, then uh, the entanglement entropy behaves like the thermodynamic entropy, meaning it's, um, it's extensive. Okay, on the other hand, many body localized, in a many body, body localized state, uh, the entanglement, because the correlations are non-local, so by, by the way, uh, um, volume law entanglement means that in order to, this, uh, entanglement, entro entanglement entropy means that in order to describe this wave function in any local basis, I'll need something like two to the L, two to the volume uh, number of coefficients, right? And, and local uh, variables, you have only L to the D, only volume uh, number of coefficients. So it means that the coefficients you need, the, the information you need in order to fully describe the system is highly, highly non-local, okay? On the, uh, in, in that sense, we can call this state delocalized. On the other hand, uh, if we want to call a state localized, it's almost clear that the entanglement entropy cannot be a volume law. Um, the number, the amount of information we need in order to, to describe it cannot scale like the volume. So it's, it actually gives, you, gives an area law. In the case of, of a one-dimensional uh, system, an area law just means a constant entanglement entropy, for example, independent of the subsystem size. Um, yeah, so, so these are uh, two different paradigms for how the entanglement entropy of eigenstates should look like. And the transition between them is very interesting because unlike any transition we know in nature, it's a transition between eigenstates having um, area law entanglement and entanglement and area, uh, eigenstates having a really extensive volume law entanglement. So for example, quantum phase transitions, we know at zero temperature, take a system from area law entangled state to another area law entangled state through a quantum phase transition where the entanglement entropy is a little bit enhanced to some, with some logarithmic correction maybe, uh, but, but nothing more. Here we really have a, a, a very drastic change in the entanglement entropy across the transition. Uh, so it, it represents a completely new kind of transition that's interesting to understand. Um, okay, so what is the conceptual framework we have to describe such quantum, uh, such dynamical quantum phase transitions like the many body localization transition? So in, in equilibrium uh, quantum phase transition, we have 
the, the standard framework is the renormalization group framework, um, where if we coarse grain our system, or if we want to look at them at lower and lower resolution or lower and lower energies, uh, then, then basically we, we can look at the, uh, successively simpler Hamiltonians, and at the end, the quantum phases are uh, uh, described by some stable fixed points, while uh, the quantum phase transitions represent, are represented by unstable fixed points of this uh, flow. So that gives us at least a conceptual framework to understand uh, fa quantum phase transitions. Uh, in out of equilibrium systems, it's, uh, this whole framework, at least the way I phrased it here, will fail because it's not possible to focus on lower and lower energies since we want to look at high energies. Okay, so, so there is no point in looking at lower and lower energies. Uh, and we, we def definitely need a new philosophy for applying uh, a renormalization group. So the out outline of my talk will be, first I'll um, try to more precisely define and review the concepts I used now in the introduction, how thermalization uh, proceeds in closed systems, what is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, and how it may be broken, say, in, in many-body localization. Um, second is uh, the, uh, I, I'll go through to the, I'll review the effective description we have for the many-body localized phase before reaching the transition, the actual phase itself. I'll show a, a uh, an RG analysis, a strong disorder RG analysis that des describes the many-body localized phase as a fixed point of, of the flow and, and show how quasi-local, how this phase can, can be understood as really an integrable system with many um, uh, conserved quantities uh, that has many conserved quantities that we call quasi-local uh, integrals of motion. And they emerge rather naturally through the RG or it can be, we can, just think of the system phenomenologically as a fixed point Hamiltonian, which is written in terms of integrals of motion. Okay. So, so I'll, I'll talk about this. Uh, then I'll go on to describe the many body localization phase transition. I'll show that there is need, uh, a need for a new RG approach for that. And I'll describe the main thing I want to show as, is universal transport and entanglement scaling uh, near this transition. Um, now, if I'll have time in the end, I, I want to describe um, very recent work that's not published yet, but it's going to be on the web soon, maybe this week. Uh, uh, it's a collaboration with Emmanuel uh, Bloch's group that is uh, observing uh, some interesting effects of many body localization uh, experimentally. Okay, if I won't have time now, then maybe we, during the discussion session, I can elaborate on this. Okay, so let me start with this, uh, the uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Eigenstate, I, I won't dwell on this much because you probably heard about it a lot. It's, it's really just a statement of equivalence of ensembles. If I take a single eigenstate, it's like taking the energy window of a microcanonical ensemble to be maximally small, just a single eigenstate. And then um, uh, the, the hypothesis says if I, if I look at the subsystem inside this eigenstate, then the microcanonical uh, correlations should be equivalent to grand canonical or canonical correlations. So I should, uh, if I, so, so all correlations I um, describe within this subsystem A that is large but still much, much smaller than the full system. Uh, are described in terms of a grand cano uh, of a canonical density matrix, uh, with the Hamiltonian appearing here being the uh, uh, just the Hamiltonian inside the subsystem, and the temperature is the temperature appropriate for this energy density that you're, you're, that the eigen the uh, energy di density of that eigenstate. Uh, in particular, if all correlations are the same, also the entanglement entropy, the entropy of this uh, subsystem A should behave like the thermal entropy at that, that is expected at that energy density and is supposed to be volume low. Now, this is only a hypothesis. It's a, 
it should work in thermalizing system, but it does, doesn't work in every system. And a very simple system where it, it fails, for example, is Anderson localization. So Anderson localization, here is an example of a one-dimensional system. We know that in one dimension, all states are localized. All single particle states are localized. And I can build a many body state by making a Slater determinant of randomly occupied particles in uh, single particle localized states. Okay, so this is a caricature of this. I put particles in uh, uh, localized states, and now I can measure the entanglement entropy. And because all these particles are localized, clearly I will not get volume law entanglement, but I'll just get area law entanglement entropy in, in any given eigenstate like, that I create like this. So, so this is an example where high energy, arbitrarily high energy eigenstates will have um, area law entanglement. Uh, and the question is, um, yeah, so, so the question of many body localization is the question of whether this state with area law entanglement is stable to interactions. And for a long time, uh, it was debated. Um, I, I should note that uh, actually Anderson himself in his original paper on Anderson localization, which was for wh which concerned non-interacting systems or single particle problem, he actually was motivated by a many-body problem of many-body localization of spins, basically silicon in uh, um, phosphorus and silicon, <coughs> so phosphorus doped silicon, and some effects in NMR that seem to show that there is absence of spin diffusion. And that was actually a many-body um, uh, phenomenon, uh, but, but he actually solved only the single particle physics. Uh, but m much later, uh, Basco, Lehner, and Altschuler, and also an, uh, another group, uh, Mirlin and collaborators, um, uh, argued theoretically that actually this um, many body, this uh, single particle Anderson lo localized state will be uh, stable to inducing small interactions. And in fact, they emphasize the fact that, they, uh, that there is going to be a, a transition between a localized uh, system at some low energies to a delocalized state as you increase the energy density or the temperature of the system. So the system will, have, uh, will be non-ergodic and in particular will show zero qu transport coefficients below this transition and will be delocalized and thermalizing above this transition. Uh, so in, in, that case, in their case, you can think of the uh, conductivity as being uh, the, the order parameter for this transition. I'll show that this is not always such a good order parameter, but uh, talk about it later. Uh, actually, in a system with a bounded energy spectrum, you can take this all the way to infinite temperature. And, and infinite, because when you have a bounded energy spectrum, then Basically, if you take a generic, if you choose in your ensemble any eigenstate generically from, from the spectrum, from somewhere in the spectrum, that means an infinite temperature ensemble. And, and that's very e um, easy and convenient to work with numerically. So, and you can ask whether at infinite temperature you have a transition between a localized and, uh, localized and a delocalized state as a function of parameters rather than temperature, say, of the function of the interaction strength or disorder strength. And uh, Organisian and Hughes and Pallid and Hughes uh, were, I think, the first to study this um, systematically using exact diagonalization. Um, here is an example of a model they studied. This is a model of it's a quantum XXZ chain with random fields. And it's equivalent, of course, by a Jordan-Wigner transformation to, to um, fermions hopping on the lattice um, with nearest neighbor interaction here. Delta is the interaction and random chemical potential. And, and they showed, I, I won't get deeply into what this, um, uh, what, what, what this um, exactly shows, but, but uh, this is some parameter that shows a crossover between uh, Poisson statistics that is represented by R something near 0.4 and um, 
uh, Wigner Dyson. So the, the hypothesis, their hypothesis was that if you look at the many body spectrum and, and look at the level statistics of the many body energy levels, these energy levels will have a Wigner Dyson statistics if the system is delocalized and thermalizing. It's the many body levels, right? Two to the n levels. And then you look at the level statistics of nearest neighbor levels. Uh, well, they will have Poisson statistics if the system is, is uh, localized. And, and now they, they changed the disorder strength at infinite temperature, meaning basically they looked at the entire spectrum. Uh, that means in, like infinite temperature. And they saw how this parameter that describes the statistics uh, crosses over from uh, um, Wigner-Dyson to Poisson, meaning the system goes from ergodic to non-ergodic. And there seems to be a crossing here as you go to uh, larger and larger system sizes maximum is 16 here, there seems to be a, cross, uh, uh, a crossing that indicates a possible phase transition between these two. So of course, these are very small system, but it's very indicative of a, a many body localization transition. Um, and, and, and the question is whether we can do better than many body localization, uh, sorry, better than uh, um, uh, exact diagonalization. So now I get to the second part of the talk, uh, where uh, I'll talk about an effective description of the many-body localized phase and uh, an URG scheme for that. So is, are there any questions uh, so far on, on the first part of the talk, the introductory part? OK, so, so let me get to, to that. Um, so first of all, I want to discuss the MBL state, a good entry point to the uh, understanding the many body localized state is, uh, is through computability. So we know that if we have a many body system, computing its dynamics is extremely costly. costly. There is no, actually there is no numerical method and that's why people were uh, basically confined to, to exact diagonalization to compute dynamics. And the reason is that there is an exponentially large number of um, states in the Hilbert space and if for ground states we have uh, uh, area law entanglement, uh, which in one dimension al allows us to, to make um, uh, good approximations like DMRG, systematic approximations that actually save a lot in, in the computational cost, when you do dynamics in DM DMRG, these are not uh, satisfied anymore. And through the, during the dynamics, the entanglement entropy grows. and you, entanglement entropy growing meaning, means that you really need the entire Hilbert space or a large part of the Hilbert space in order to, to represent your state and the system is actually fundamentally incomputable anymore. So uh, in, in a many body localized state, there is a hope that it will remain computable because if the uh, uh, system is localized, you start with a low entanglement state, then you stay uh, unentangled. So one way to uh, and, um, you know, quantify it is to start with a state a spin system like this with all the spins either up or down. So of course, this is a classical state with no entanglement. Turn on time evolution now and, and see how the system gets, how correlations are built. If the system is localized again, then correlations, uh, you expect at least that correlations will not be built between spins at long distances and then entanglement entropy instead of instead of going up linearly like in clean systems will saturate after some uh, time scale associated with localizing of these particles okay so uh, localizing of the particles or localizing of the correlations so that's a naive expectation and uh, calculations were done for example by by Joel Moore and, and um, yeah, Frank Pullman and, and Jens Barderson, uh, they studied this effect systematically in the same model I showed you before. Here, the interaction is JZ. And in fact, in, indeed, if, if you put the interactions to zero, is there any question? So, so if, if you put the interaction to zero, you see a, a growth of the entanglement entropy and then saturation. But as you crank up the interaction, you see that the entanglement entropy actually at, at some point shoots up and, and um, grows logarithmically in time. So much slower than you expect in, in clean systems, but still it grows uh, logarithmically in time. That was at, at the time a surprise. Uh, and it was seen by other people in other models. 
and, and, and was at that time not, not explained. So, so, so the uh, uh, upshot of this is that in a many body localized state, it looks like entanglement doesn't uh, uh, stop growing, but it grows much uh, slower. Uh, in an unbounded way in an infinite system, but if you actually take a finite subsystem, even of an infinite system, uh, what you see is that the entanglement entropy saturates after some time, and it saturates to a volume law entanglement, like in equilibrium. However, this volume law is not the full extensive entropy you expect in a thermodynamic system. It's less than the thermal entropy, okay, in general. So, so that's uh, uh, so. So, of, uh, from all this, we see that in fact, DMRG will be a good method to uh, uh, calculate the dynamics of many-body localized states for for fairly long times, but not infinite times usually, because the entanglement entropy still grows. Yes. So, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about this. So that's one of the questions. Why, why does it grow logarithmically, and why is there a difference? The difference is because the system, the many-body localized system actually doesn't equilibrate. It doesn't go to thermal equilibrium. So if thermal equilibrium will tell you that at this energy density, you must have this entropy, this will have less than the entropy. So it means that there are some degrees of freedom that actually uh, um, completely decohere, but there are some Re residual degrees of freedom that don't, don't decohere in the quantum and classical information in them persists locally. And, and wh while it would be equipartitioned if, if the system had equilibrated. So some of the information remains and doesn't, is not lost from the subsystem. Y yes, so that would be one of the conclusions. There are some conservation laws, a lot of conservation laws that the, in, in fact, if, you, if your initial state somehow didn't constrain these conservation laws, then the entanglement entropy would supposedly grow to the full value. But because you're constraining them, it does not grow. Yes. And you'll see that this will actually, these conservation laws will um, automatically emerge from, from an, a renormalization group to, uh, treatment. Yeah, so they start from this uh, classical state. They use this Hamiltonian to evolve the system. And um, they measure the entanglement entropy across this cut of, in the middle of the system. And that's what, what, what is shown here. OK. Um, yes? No, so uh, here it's, uh, yeah, it's a good question, but I think here the way it's done is it's um, time evolving block decimation technique. So you basically start with, you can start with an initial state. You don't have to target any, so, so it's, it's one way to converge to the ground state actually is not use the DMRG algorithm, but use uh, algorithm where you basically time evolve some initial state using the, um, e to the minus beta h and take beta to infinity. And now, you, instead of evolving with e to the minus beta h, you evolve with the evolution operator. So that's not, it's just a, a variation in matrix product state ansatz, a time dependent variation approach. Um, um, so, okay, so the, uh, now I'm going to show another uh, uh, way to solve this time-dependent problem that can give some analytic insights uh, and, and show how these conservation rules emerge uh, exactly. So, so uh, this approach was developed with uh, Ron and Vosk in, in these two papers, and I'll, show, I'll exemplify it on the, hub, on the Ising model. So this is a, a transverse field Ising model with some extra terms that will make it non-integrable. Without these extra terms, then it can be mapped to free fermions. I don't want it to be 
uh, map to free fermions. And then I take, just like in this uh, uh, DMRG simulation I showed below, uh, before uh, the, uh, I, I start the system with some non-entangled state where the spins are randomly oriented up or down in the z direction, say, for example. And, and then I start the time evolution with this Hamiltonian, and I want to know how it proceeds. So here is the idea. The idea is that since there is a very, let's assume there is very strong disorder here. Yes? So the are all random. They're all random, yes. And if, in, if they're not, they'll be generated, randomness will be generated by the RG, so you start all random. Um, so they're all random, and if the disorder is strong, I, I, I take the philosophy of strong disorder RG, originally this Gupta and Ma and, and Fisher's uh, philosophy, and, and basically take at first, in the, at the first zeroth order approximation, solve the strongest bonds in the system, okay? So the strongest bond in the systems will uh, typically be, if the disorder is strong, much, much, much larger than the nearby environment. Okay, so I can do time-dependent perturbation theory in a controlled way. Uh, so let's call omega the maximal energy scale, the maximal bond. And, and the idea is, suppose this maximum bond was a, a transverse field. If this was a transverse field, then that f spin will rotate very, very fast, wh while other spins would be essentially frozen. So I can solve uh, this fast Hamiltonian as a first uh, zeroth approximation where, with all spins frozen at time scales t much smaller than uh, 1 over omega, and at larger time scales than 1 over omega, I can eliminate these fast oscillations perturbatively and find uh, an effective Hamiltonian for the slower spins, how it modifies the effective Hamiltonian for the slower spins. So, so you can do that, and uh, it gives you a, a flow of the Hamiltonian parameters in real time. It allows you, you can also track how, what operators are doing during this flow, and it can allow you to compute the entanglement entropy, and it reproduces the logarithmic growth of the entanglement entropy. And in special cases like a criticalizing model, it gives you some enhanced logarithmic growth, it like log to some power. Um, so you can get more than just the logarithmic growth, but in the generic case, it reproduces the logarithmic growth of the entanglement entropy. Uh, the uh, important uh, con conceptually, the important outcome of this RG are conserved quantities. So what, what happens in this RG? There is something different in the philosophy of this RG than the ground state RG. In, a ground, in the ground state, what you do actually is you pick the largest, two, two largest spins, you, uh, sorry, you, you pick the largest bond on the, or the largest tra transverse field and el simply eliminate that spin or that bond from your, your system. You eliminate degrees of freedom. Okay, here you don't eliminate this, the, uh, these degrees of freedom if you actually compute the effective Hamiltonian through the, some kind of unitary transformation, you see that the effective Hamiltonian you get includes the bond that, or let's, let's take the case where the largest um, uh, energy scale is a transverse field, so it acts on a single spin. You don't eliminate that spin. That spin is still here in the effective Hamiltonian. However, while before it was not a conserved quantity, you see now it commutes with everything. It's, it's an, it, so the effective Hamilton, uh, Hamiltonian you generate between the left and right spin is Sz left times Sz right times Sx of the middle spin. So Sx still remains here, but it's a conserved quantity. So what you've done by doing this unitary transformation, every unitary transformation you do to uh, go from the Hamiltonian at scale omega to a scale omega minus delta omega, you rotate one degree of freedom to be a, a conserved quantity. So in the end, you're left with a Hamiltonian that's made only of these conserved quantities. So the fixed point Hamiltonian, and actually these conserved quantities, there, there are interactions between these conserved quantities mediated by terms like this. So in the end, you get an interaction, a, a, a Hamiltonian that looks, well, I'll, I'll show in a minute how it looks, but, but uh, this conserved quantity really is not Sx, I, I call it Sx tilde because it's Sx after some unitary transformation, it's Sx plus some non-local contribution, small non-local contribution. So, so your uh, um, uh, conserved quantities become some overlap factor Z 
times uh, the original sigma x operator, for example, plus an exponential tail. This is the example when I take out a spin sigma x. If I eliminate um, spins sigma z by a large, uh, because of a large Ising interaction, then sigma z's will become uh, conserved quantities. Okay? Yes? This works only in the many body localized ways? If you want to try to inverse on another thing where you have a transition from a thermal phase to the many body localized It will fail completely. I'll show you exactly in, in a few slides. I have a slide on it, so, so wait, okay? Because when I I'll go to a different RG scheme that doesn't fail there, I'll, I'll show how it fails. It fails basically because it doesn't take resonances into account. But let me show what exactly are these resonances. So, so yeah, but this is a good point. This RG works only in the localized phase. It's much more fragile than this RG for the ground state, as I'll show in a minute. Um, so in some sense, it assumes the many-body localized phase and asks, if I have a many-body localized phase where resonances are not important, what will be the dynamics then? Uh, so, so again, so I, as I said, the fixed-point Hamiltonian in the end looks like this. It has only interactions between some conserved quantities, quasi-conserved quantities, that are, have a finite overlap with the original uh, spins, with the original constituent degrees of freedom, and the uh, interactions, the long, there, there are long-range interactions generated between these, uh, well, not long-range, long they're exponentially, but uh, they, they have tails, long-range exponential tails uh, uh, between, between these uh, uh, spins. And note, I, I, I like to think of this as the Fermi liquid theory of many-body localized state because um, there is a clear analogy, the fixed point Hamiltonian, in essentially any fixed point Hamiltonian, it's very clear in the Fermi liquid theory, uh, the fixed point Hamiltonian is also a fixed point Hamiltonian written only in terms of conserved quantities. In this case, it's nk, the number of quasi-particles, at k's very close to the Fermi surface. Okay, the difference is that uh, in, in the many-body localized state, it's, uh, uh, you have the number of conserved quantities is as large as the number of degrees of freedom, or at least of the same order. While in, in Fermi liquid theory, you have only um, uh, a shell, in mom uh, a thin shell in momentum space. Uh, uh, actually, just uh, uh, asymptotically, just uh, a zero me measure zero shell in momentum space where these um, uh, conserved quantities reside. So, uh, so that's why here you have to go to low energies. Here you don't have to go to low energies. Uh, they're, they're real conserved quantities that in the Hilbert space. Um, so, so now this, is, this can be derived by RG, or at least morally derived by RG, but you can also postulate it as a phenomenological description of the many-body localized phase, as has been done independently by... Uh, Dimo Ganesian, David Hughes, and by uh, Dima Abanin and, and collaborators. So they basically took this Hamiltonian as a phenomenological Hamiltonian from which you can learn a lot about the many-body localized phase. I don't have a, 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 a lot of time to go through it, but maybe later I can give some more examples. For example, you can show that there is persistence of local coherence. You can have spin echoes that survive indefinitely in the localized phase, and you can use just this phenomenological model in order to show it. Uh, you can give a very simple explanation for the logarithmic growth of, an, of the entanglement entropy, which has, can show that it basically directly is directly related uh, to, to the uh, exponential decay of the interaction. So basically entanglement grows between two degrees of freedom, not because there is propagation of particles or energy, but simply because the, you have spins independently processing, but you generate long-range interactions between them, and then these two processions become entangled with each other after exponentially long time. And this exponentially long time for them to get entangled is translated to a logarithmic growth in the entanglement entropy. I can show it in, uh, well, it's a one-line calculation. I can show it later if someone asks. Uh, but that's very easy to show out of the, uh, this effective theory. Um, it also gives you, uh, so this logarithmic growth of entanglement entropy is a, is a nice 
signature of many body localization that's, and differentiates it from single particle Anderson localization. But you may ask, well, entanglement entropy is nothing, it's not something I can easily measure. Is there some measure that's uh, um, uh, easier to, to, uh, to probe? And in fact, you can show that the relaxation of observables that um, are related to conserved quantities uh, these conserved quantities in the many body localized phase have anomalous relaxation and for example have fluctuations uh, that um, um, decay as power laws and these power laws uh, come from exactly the same source as this growth of entanglement entropy so so if you look basically if you look at the noise in various observables um, that are relaxing to their non-equilibrium steady states in uh, many body localized phase, you can see effects that are essentially the same as this logarithmic growth of entanglement entropy. I'll discuss this, this a, a bit later in relation to the experiment with Emmanuel Bloch. Um, okay, um, don't have much time I see, so uh, maybe I'll jump over this just quickly. So the fact that we have um, uh, conserved quantities, for example, sigma x was a possible conserved quantity, means that we can have actually different phases where th there is a, a fundamental change in the nature of the conserved quantities. For example, in the Ising model, we can have a paramagnetic phase where the integrals of motion are sigma x and they are even under the Ising symmetry, and we can have another so, so called the gla eigenstate glass phase or Hilbert glass phase where the integrals of motion are sigma z like and, and are odd under the symmetry. Okay, so, so and, and in this phase, basically, if you look at individual eigenstates, each individual eigenstate has a broken symmetry. Um, and uh, you can also have actually uh, cases where the conserved quantities have a non-trivial topology associated with them, and then you have a topological many-body localized state, and you can see edge states um, with coherent edge states that you can manipulate that behave like free spins and so on. So um, I'll jump over this. Okay, so now the, pli uh, the slide I promised uh, Subroto to show, um, wh what's the, the process that destroys this RG scheme when I get close to the many body localization transition. So remember the essential thing was that I take two spins somewhere or a single spin and there are two energy states, high and low energy state. And essentially because I want to f solve the full dynamics, I'm not eliminating states. I'm either choosing the upper state, the higher energy state or the lower energy state. And somewhere in far away, there can be another spin I take out at a slightly lower energy scale, omega minus delta omega. And again, I have to choose either the high energy state or the low energy state. As opposed to the ground state scheme where I'd have to choose both of them to be in the lower energy state. Here I choose, I can have the situation where I chose this to be in the lower energy state or and this one to, in the high energy state. So now, I, through the other spins in the middle, I can mediate an interaction that will cause a flip and that, would, that flip involves a low energy scale, which is just the difference delta omega between them. In, in the dynamical context that I described before, this means that um, I, I took out this spin because it, it's in, it involves a high frequency omega. This one also involves a high frequency omega minus delta omega, but, but there is a beating mode which has a low frequency uh, at, the, at exactly the difference between these frequencies, which I'm not taking into account. Right, in the many body localized state, in order for these to be a, a resonance and actually to be effective, really you, you need that the effective interaction between these two spins is larger, uh, two uh, possibly resonant spins will be larger than the energy difference between them. And, and that's the, the criterion. Now you can derive this uh, as you can show that if the disorder is sufficiently strong, and you take out the, the uh, distributions generated by the RG, then for sufficiently strong disorder, when you're sufficiently far from the many body localization transition, then uh, these resonances become uh, ineffective. So you basically at most have isolated resonances like that. 
you cannot create a chain of resonant, um, many, many, many resonant uh, particles. You can maybe create two, 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 and just these isolated resonances presumably don't interfere much with the many body localized state. But you cannot make an infinite chain. So, so that's, that's the, well, that was the idea from our analysis. That was the outcome of the analysis back then. It's just a self-consistency argument that the RG generates distributions that don't lead to these resonances. But now if we want to describe the transition, we have to take them into account fully somehow, which is hard. Yes. Yeah, that's right. This kills the conservation laws because the conservation law can be, for example, that these spins are, are up. The, yes, the resonances are processes that actually flip you between that flip between conserved subspaces. Yeah, and and once once they proliferate, then you're essentially dead. You're, you're not localized anymore. And any RG scheme that wants to capture the transition has to take them somehow into account. Uh, so, okay, so now we are back to the question, how to describe this transition. And uh, so the idea we, pers we started pursuing a long time ago, actually even before uh, starting to work on the RG for the localized phase, but it was conceptually harder and we didn't know how to proceed. So finally we got some um, uh, progress in this and, and could publish. Uh, the, the idea is to, instead of working on the microscopic model, uh, like we did for the uh, RG for the localized phase, let's start already with the coarse-grained model and think what is the correct coarse-grained model close to the critical point. And, and the idea is that you have this order, you have all these uh, uh, spins here, and it's you know, likely that close to the transition, some of the spins will be in chains that locally look conducting, look um, uh, thermalizing, while other chains of spins will have stronger di disorder locally and will be more insulating-like, okay? They're not yet insulators or conductors because they're all finite size chains. If you take them isolated, they will look more like conductors or more like insulators. So, and, and as we noted before, ones that look more like conductors will have a many-body spectrum that is influenced by resonances and therefore will be Wigner-Dyson-like. And ones that don't, are not influenced by resonances will be Poisson, more Poisson. So, so we have, we, we, discuss, we, we now are going to describe this, uh, these puddles by random matrices. And each random matrix has either more Poisson-like statistics or more Wigner-Dyson statistics, and there is going to be a parameter G that kind of continuously uh, can continuously tune between Wigner-Dyson and Poisson statistics. Okay, that's now now note that this is like a spin model. Each each random matrix is like a spin. So so the full Hilbert space is still two to the n, right? So there is a two to the l one um, matrix here, two to the l two matrix here, and there not concatenated there there it's a direct product of these uh, matrices yeah well um they they cannot fluctuate uh, if you look okay so so i'm going to start with some some uh, maybe arbitrary um uh, division of the system into these matrices now as i go to lower and lower energies or lo so n lower frequencies or lo uh, longer time scales, I'll have to, I'm going to coarse grain more and more and that will be in a sense like fluctuation. So I'll have to look at a larger grain as, as my true system. So let, let, let me explain further and you'll see. So, so the idea is that there is going to be this dimensionless parameter G and let me describe what it, it exactly is. So first let's look at what are the important energy scales. Uh, if I take a grain like that, it has a mean level spacing. It's a mean many body level spacing. So uh, for example, delta I goes like, delta I goes like some microscopic energy over two to the L I. 
right? It's, it's, uh, it's a many body level spacing. Um, gamma is some entangle, I call it entanglement time. It's a time that it will take the left, if I look at dynamics, it will take the left spin to fully entangle with the right spin, okay? Or in other words, if I connect this grain to some conducting lead, what will be the time for the uh, uh, furthest most spin to thermalize with the, the conducting lead? Yes? So maybe it makes sense, but how is the initial spin in your system? Uh, it, this is just, I'm philosophically sp splitting them. I'm not actually going to split my system ever. I'm going to start with a system where I already think of it as split. You, you see, my initial model is not going to be, I'm not going to start, be able to start from my, the microscopics and go all the way to the fixed point. But as always done in these things, in, in RG, actually, you start with some model which you think is already close to the fixed point. So you haven't gone through the whole process of integrating out, really, the highest energy modes, okay? So in that sense, it will be similar. So, so now the dimensionless ratio between this um, entanglement rate and the level spacing is, is, a sen is, for the random matrix, is approximately a correlation length in number of levels. It's the number of correlated levels. It's a number. Uh, and and if, if this entanglement rate is much larger than the level spacing, then uh, you have, uh, uh, then G is much larger than one, and it's a thermalizing box. And if it's the other way around, G is much smaller than one, I call it an insulating box. And it has uh, we, uh, Poisson statistics. Okay, so that's, G is my, my tuning parameter between Poisson and, and, and Wigner-Dyson. Um, how much time do I have? I started a bit late. Eh? Eight, minutes. Eight minutes. Okay, so I'll, I'll finish this and maybe on the experiment, if I'll have some time in the discussion, I can comment. Okay, um, so uh, uh, just a small uh, digression and it helps to understand. So suppose this is a block. Uh, this is one of my blocks, and these are my energy levels. I can make uh, an, like an imaginary cut in between, and I can start my system in a product state of the two halves of the block, and, and now wait for it to entangle. So now you can think of this as a kind of a Fermi-Golden rule process generated by the small couplings between the two sides of the block, and if I start with some, um, some state like that, quickly it will you know, decay into many other states um, uh, while conserving energy. Now, um, because the matrix elements that cause this, uh, these transitions are of order one, I can only make energy changes of order one, but generically I'll have an energy difference between the two sides that is of order L, right? Because it, it's an it's, uh, uh, extensive energy difference. But, but uh, to entangle the system, it's enough to make transitions of order one. Because in an order one energy spacing, you still have approximately up to maybe some power law correction, you still have two to the L states. So, so, so uh, this can entangle, get two, uh, you can get an extensive entanglement entropy just by making transitions, accessing states uh, of order one away from your state and not order L. However, if you want to transport energy from this side to this side, you need to transport extensive energy. So uh, that's why this, the transport time, you need to make L such transitions in order to transport an extensive amount of energy. And that's why the transport time is not exactly the same as the entanglement time that I wrote before. It's actually L times the entanglement time. Okay, so there is a, uh, direct scaling relation between the transport time and the entanglement time. All of this is not going to be important at the fixed point at all because uh, the times at the fixed point are going to have an exponential relation with the length and this L will be subleading, but it's important to keep in mind. Uh, what is because of the area law? Entanglement is, uh, no, no, the, the, uh, the fact that there is order one energy you can get fully entangled is because you have, uh, because the number, because the level spacing is W over two to the Li. So in level, so even if you have uh, um, uh, a spacing of, le of, of one, you have order one, actually it's W times L over two. two. So the whole bandwidth is some W times L. 
but in a spacing of uh, W, you have maybe, uh, uh, you have two to the L levels over L. But this over L is not really important for entanglement. So, so you get fully entangled, but you don't transport all the heat. Anyways, it's not so important for the critical point. So let, let me go on and maybe explain later. Uh, so, so here is, for your question, this is the starting chain. I, I really start with a chain of uh, random matrices like that, where each block is defined by, by some rate gamma and some G, dimensionless G. Uh, and now also each pair of blocks have gamma and Gs associated with the links between them. Now what does this mean? These gammas and Gs between them mean the, just the simple thing that if I take these two blocks and cut them away from the chain and consider them, the two of them, together as a single block, then this would be the entangled end-to-end -end entanglement rate, gamma 3, 4, uh, uh, four and, and G3, 4 would be simply the ratio between gamma 3, 4 and the level spacing of the two blocks, okay? So now you, you ask how I, I cut, I, 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 don't, I never do anything, I just get this model as an input. Okay, so this is my, the input for my RG are distributions of these gammas and, and these gammas. Okay, and uh, it's, it's just an input for the RG. And, and now the way I proceed, okay, so these are gamma IJ there, and uh, we have two types of links, by the way. Uh, if GIJ on the link is much larger than one, then this link is, is metallic, and I can basically, it's effective, it, it thermalizes. Uh, on the other hand, if G is small, then the uh, entanglement across this whole system is much slower than the inverse level spacing, and I call this an insulating link, okay? Uh, now, how do, I, uh, how do I proceed with the RG? The schematic is very sim uh, simple. I, I look at all the links, and I pick the uh, largest gamma, so the two, two grains that entangle with each other in the fastest, uh, fastest, and call them a single grain, okay? And, that's, and I, I just combine them into a single grain. That's uh, how the RG uh, proceeds. That's my definition for internal gamma, right? All the internal gra gammas are large, and all the ones here are uh, above the cutoff, are, are small, okay? Uh, sorry, all of the ones inside are above the cutoff omega, and all of these are below the cutoff. And when one gets below the cutoff, I just put it in, okay? I combine them into a single one. So this is easy because I have the, uh, these gamma 3, 4, uh, G3, 4 from in advance. What is not so easy is what are the left, uh, the couplings, new couplings generated to the left and to the right matrices, okay? And that one has to somehow compute. So how do you compute this? And, and now you let this flow. So before saying how to compute, what's the idea? The idea is very simple. simple. Now I let this thing flow and um, ask what, and in the end, I get just one single big uh, random matrix with a parameter G in it. And I want to know whether this G flowed to much larger than one Wigner Dyson or much uh, smaller than one, meaning Poisson. And that would be the transition between these two uh, possible fixed points, uh, and uh, the transi uh, So, so how do I do uh, the uh, the actual RG rules? How do I combine this and find the, the link to the next one? There are two simple limits. The two simple limits in w is are when uh, these two links are insulating. When these two links are insulating, one can do a direct perturbative calculation and show that uh, the new gamma is basically gamma one two times gamma two three over gamma two. And you don't even have to derive it from first principles. You can, we know it from the RG of the uh, insulating phase that, um, um, that uh, okay, we can take, okay, so we can take, let's take this and take the log of the two sides uh, and convert one over gamma, I call it the time, and you get this um, um, log of the total time equals log of uh, one, two, times plus log of two, three minus log two. Now we remember that in the insulating phase, the uh, time and length have a, a exponential um, dependence, uh, have an exponential relation between them. So this rule is simply the adding up of the lengths 
of the, of the system. And and um, of course, lengths have to add. So so in the insulator, this should be correct. My, and this minus L two is simply subtracting the length, double counted length. Okay. The other simple limit is when the two links are uh, thermalizing. G12 and G23 are both thermalizing. In this case, we can't derive anything from first principles. But then when we, ha we have two thermalizing links, then Ohm's law st simply holds. So, so really, we should, add up, uh, we should add up 1 over gammas. We should add up times, essentially. So uh, actually, when Ohm's law holds for uh, transport, then it's, uh, the entanglement propagates ballistically. That's related to the uh, scaling relation I showed. And, and this is why you should add up times for entanglement. Um, and and so, so 1 over gamma of the uh, three block system is just adding up of the times of uh, 1, 2, and 2, 3, and subtracting the um, double counted one. So basically, I, what I have, what I've done is I'm, I have a good description for big insulating regions, sorry, big insulating regions and big conducting regions. I know the correct scaling there. And what is mi missing is just rules where uh, th the three matrices lie in interfaces between them. And, and these, at least, we, at least in the limit where G is always either much larger than one or much smaller than one, one can actually, at least with pretty good confidence uh, derive rules for the interfaces too. And ev even if you change a little bit these rules, the uh, fixed point doesn't change so much. So, so that's, um, we can discuss uh, how to do it exactly, but that's a bit more complicated to treat the interfaces. So what is the outcome of the RG flow? And just a, a few slides. As I said, we, as we integrate out, as, as we a um, couple more and more blocks into, a, into uh, larger blocks, uh, G changes. And depending on the uh, initial conditions, the initial conditions is G naught. What I call G naught is the, G, the average or the typical G in the initial distribution. Depending on that, whether it's large or small, I can either flow to a case where log G goes to very negative values, meaning G, G goes to something much smaller than one or much larger than one. So I can either go to a many body localized phase or a critical phase. Now I want to, um, to describe this transition a bit uh, more systematically. So, so first of all, here what you see is the, uh, this graph is just the slope D log G D L. Uh, and you see it goes from negative to positive through a trans some transition. So mm, the first thing we asked ourselves is how does diffusion disappear as you get to the critical point? And the surprising thing we find, so, so that's easy to check because we can measure uh, gamma. We, we, that's the information we keep in the RG. We have gamma and we have the length of the clusters. And we can measure the relation between length and time. And, and, and see how, if it's diffusive, how this uh, D, the diffusion coefficient goes to 0. But what we find, actually, is that it's diffusive in deep in the uh, thermalizing phase. But then the way it disappears, the diffusion, is simply that the dynamical critical exponent, or inverse z, 1 over z, alpha, is, is the inverse dynamical critical exponent. Actually, uh, dynamical exponent just goes to 0 smoothly. So instead of. Uh, diffusion disappearing by the diffusion coefficient going to zero, you have a whole region here uh, which is subdiffusive and, and with a continuously changing exponent alpha. So alpha goes to zero. Alpha is the relation between L goes like t to the alpha, while diffusion will be square root, right? And then in the insulating phase, you see that you get this uh, logarithmic uh, dependence between length and time. So is there a second transition here? Yeah. This is not so clear. Yeah, that could be tra a transition. So I have to say that the RG, so I, I, what, what I said before, that our RG relies on the fact that G is always much smaller than 1 or much bigger than 1. And uh, uh, to describe this transition, um, I think this, uh, basically this already doesn't apply. So I think the RG is not going to be very good in describing it. And I have to say, I don't, I'm not even confident within this RG whether there is a transition like that or, uh, or whether it just asymptotically reaches diffusion. 
and, and because this, and there might, might not be a transition for another reason, because this is really a line of fixed points. So, so every point alpha is just a different alpha, and then you basically, it's like a Griffith phase. And, and then you just have the uh, last fixed point is the one uh, with, with alpha equals half. So I'm not sure there is actually an unstable fixed point associated with that. Um, so, OK, by the way, this is supported by numerical studies by others. Uh, but here we understand exactly, because of this RG, we understand exactly uh, where this comes from. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, you have, uh, OK, so, so we don't need the RG actually to understand it. We, it's easy to understand through RG. But the easiest way to understand it is if we have a critical point at some point, uh, here, for example, uh, then you can ask yourself, if you go to the critical point from the conducting side, you have, uh, a, you have a diverging length scale, psi. What does this converging, uh, diverging length scale mean? It means that you have uh, puddles of rare, rare insulating puddles in the, in the metal. So usually, if you look at scales below psi, it's very likely to find some insulating puddle. If you look at larger length scale, it's unlikely. And, and it, uh, this uh, uh, probability decays exponentially if you go to lengths much larger than uh, the correlation length psi, the probability to find an insulating puddle. So you'd say, OK, I have, uh, it's unlikely, and it will not contribute to anything. But it turns out, because an insulating puddle to transport energy or entanglement through it takes uh, an exponentially long time, then even if it's exponentially rare, it will uh, affect the average. Right? Uh, because it's an exponentially rare event that, give, that contributes an exponentially long uh, time. Uh, so if you average the time, or if you look at the distribution of the time, it will lead to a um, uh, um, power law distribution of times. And you can show directly that this leads to, to this uh, um, dynamical critical exponent, or alpha, that goes like L0 over xi. Okay? So this is the reason. And the last. The last thing I want to show, the last two slides, uh, re uh, relates to scaling of entanglement entropy at the transition. So you can also calculate something that's closely related to the entanglement entropy by um, running the RG until you have just two blocks left. And then you can show that this G that you are calculating, the G of the link is strongly, is directly related to the entanglement entropy of, of the system cut in, in this link. Um, so, so uh, uh, basically, log of g plus 1 is uh, approximately the entanglement entropy. So now you can, uh, you can calculate it, and uh, you can run the RG numerically. We can only do it numerically. We can, can run the RG and calculate the entanglement entropy. And if you have a small system, you see that at deep in the insulating phase, the entanglement entropy, we calculate the this is the entanglement entropy over the thermal entanglement entropy, which is uh, entanglement entropy over L, the specific entropy. It's 0 in, in the insulating phase. And it goes to 1 uh, deep in the uh, conducting phase. And you see that it actually, uh, as you go to larger and larger, larger systems, uh, it becomes a steeper and steeper change. Uh, and, and you can do the same for the fluctuation of the entanglement entropy, because you can compute the whole distribution. Uh, and you also see that it becomes sharper and sharper, and you have a sharp peak close to the transition. Uh, and that suggests uh, to, to, do, to scale this. So if you scale all these plots um, with a critical exponent uh, associated with the diverging correlation length, uh, you see that they scale very well on top of each other if we choose this exponent to be uh, 2.81. And that also helps us locate the critical point we can do it in another way, and it turns out the same way thing. And you see that you get an entanglement. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the entanglement goes always to uh, 1, and the fluctuation goes to 0. What this means is that this fixed point has, so if you're to the right of this fixed point, at 0 is the fixed point. If you're to the right of the fixed point, you always flow this way, right? L goes this way. You always flow to a thermal ent entropy, and you flow to 0 fluctuation of the entanglement entropy. So we flow to a thermal phase. So there was a question whether uh, there is a non-ergodic um, delocalized phase 
uh, beyond the many body localized phase, and that answers the question. There is a subdiffusive phase, but it's fully thermal. So the entanglement is fully thermal, and the uh, fluctuation is, is zero. Um, okay, so to summarize, I showed you two paradigms, many body localized and thermalizing uh, phases. Um, the, uh, this, the many body localized phase has quantum coherent dynamics, area law entanglement. The thermalizing phase has classical dynamics and volume law entanglement. It's interesting to understand the transition between them because it's, it's unlike any transitions we have. Uh, so first I showed you that we can, an RG approach can describe the dynamics, effective dynamics inside the localized phase. And, and uh, there is a different RG approach uh, based on coupled random matrices that describes the transition between this area law entangled and volume law entangled state. And one corollary of this approach was that there is a, a, the transition, at least in, in one dimension, actually, it's special to one dimension, from the uh, localized phase uh, to the delocalized phase goes through a subdiffusive uh, region and rather than uh, the uh, diffusion coefficient uh, vanishing at the critical point. Um, and there is at this, trans at this critical point is described by a broadly distributed, I, I, I didn't mention, I didn't emphasize another thing that at the critical point, so you can ask how, that was the question I posed initially, how does the uh, entanglement entropy go from area law to volume law? So the way it goes from area law to volume law is at the critical point exactly, if you look at half system entanglement entropy, it has, it's maximally broad. It, there is a, the, 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 you have a full distribution of entanglement entropies between zero and, uh, um, and the full uh, thermal entanglement entropy at the critical point itself, and then you flow to thermal entanglement entropy with zero fluctuations. Okay. So, of course, we want to generalize it later to higher dimensions. Um, and we, an interesting question is whether there are other paradigms of non-thermal states, um, such as in translational invariant systems, for example, or non-thermal delocalized states. Um, are there numerical approaches to understand dynamical quantum systems better? Help? And probably the most important question, can we see all of this in, uh, in experiments? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Let's thank Yehud for his stimulating presentation.